cool. That is, bring that new year in. But every year, people, they stay up late just to watch uh, the old year go out and the new one to come in. And, and the thing is, there's lots of ways to do that, right? It, so who, who here, just give me one idea. What way do you watch the new year come in, anybody? The ball fall. The ball fall. Okay, and what did you say, Martha? I'm always asleep. Oh, you're always asleep. Yes, you bring in the new year sleeping. So that's cool. Happy new year. But yes, the ball drop. There's all kinds of ways to bring in the new year. Uh, you can stay up lot, late, and you can watch the ball drop over in um, uh, Times Square in New York. You know, you, I mean, I've been doing that, I think, all my life. You know, I, I just watch that ball drop. I don't know why, but I do. But, you know, and so it's real celebratory. But the thing is, this year, you know what I did getting prepared for this sermon and everything? I did some investigating. And did you know that New York is not the only state that does a significant New Year's drop. Um, Because what I found out was this. There's a watermelon drop in Indiana. Why watermelon? I have no idea. But there's a pine cone drop in Arizona. I'm like, what? Why didn't they drop a cactus? It would be representing who they are, right? And then there's beach ball drop in Florida, more appropriate. And then there's a peach drop in Georgia. But the one that I found that I really, it was my favorite is that there was a thousand pound piece of Gouda cheese. And in Wisconsin, they have the fire department come out with their cranes. They lift this hunk of cheese, thousand pounds of Gouda cheese. They bring it up. And when the New Year's comes in, they drop it. And so, and it gets better. Because at the end of that, everybody that's there, they just start hacking in to this thousand pound piece of cheese. So everybody goes home, you know, with a basket full of cheese. I thought, how cool would that be? We got to start something. And then I, I checked out California. And do you know we do nothing? We have no kind of drop on New Year's Eve. But we, what, we have the Rose Parade, huh? That's a biggie. The, the, the rest of the country watches us. So I guess that works. But the truth is that each and every one of us, we have this expectation that this new year, it's going to be way better than the last one. You know, that's just an expectation that we have. And, and, and I just have this tendency to kind of overthink things. And, I, you know, I'm an optimist, and I stay up to see the new year come in. Now, my wife, because they always say opposites attract. And my wife and I, uh, when we were doing premarital counseling, when we were getting married, we did this test thing. And they show you your scores where you hit high and then you hit low in your personality traits. The man that was doing our counseling, he put our, our graphs together and he goes, wherever you peak, she bottoms. And wherever she peaks, you guys are complete opposites. Remember, he told us, I said, you guys are so, I've never seen that before. But the truth of the matter is, is that opposites, they do attract. And, but here's the thing. Cindy, see, I'm an optimist and she is a a pessimist. And I think that she stays up to watch the new year just to see if the old one left. You know, because that's kind of her mindset. But this new year's. There are three things that I think that we really need to think about when we're bringing in this new year of 2024. So there are three things that I'd like to share with you. Um, what is your attitude going into this new year? Is it stinky? You, are you bringing a stinky attitude into the new year? Think about it. You know, what, I mean, just be real. What's your attitude about life right now? And who or what have you been putting your faith in for real? Who or what have you been putting your faith in last year? You know, was it in your bank account? Was it, you know, was it in your job title? What is it that you put your faith in? See, what part do you play in this whole process? What part do you play in that? So let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say about our main text for this morning. But before we go there, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background about the scriptural text. Because it's really important. Because, see... In this text, what is going on? The Apostle Paul, he is, he's assisting and helping the church at Corinth. Because they're having a little bit of troubles and, and there's a little bit of riff in the community. And the community leaders, they are so not down with the Apostles and Paul. So much so that they're ridiculing them. Now, 
according to my research, they were pretty conceited people. And what they were doing is they were looking at the apostles and go, look at the way you dress. You know, is there a God? Look at you guys look so goofy, you know, and, and they were also looking at how they believed. You guys are crazy. Look at what you believe. You really believe that? And these are the leaders of Corinth. And so Paul, he writes this text because he knows the minute they stop ridiculing him, they're going to switch right over to the church body. See, so they would come after me first and they'd say all kinds of things. And then when they got tired of that, they'd come right at you guys. See, that's what Paul is facing right now. So he puts together, he talks to them. And I love how he puts it because he doesn't really address all that stuff. He just stays right in the gospel. So now he's talking, we're going to read about how he's talking to the Corinthians about the gospel and what they really need to focus on. So let's read the text. And you're going to see how his words are kind of protecting him from that kind of the people that are around them. So let's see how it reads. It reads like this. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 through 17. And today I have chosen to read out of the NIRV. Boom. For hundreds of years in our church, we've read out of the NIV. But today we're going to read out of the NIRV, which is the New International Reader Version. So it reads like this. We know that it means we know what it means to have respect for the Lord. So we try to help other people to understand it. What we are is plain to God. And I hope that it is also plain to your way of thinking. We are not trying to make an appeal to you again, but we are giving you a chance to take pride in us. Some people take pride in their looks rather than what is in their heart. And if you take pride in us, you will be able to answer them. Are we out of our minds, as some people would say? If so, it is because we want to serve God. Does what we say make sense? If so, it is because we want to serve you. Christ's love controls us. And we are sure that one person died for everyone. And so everyone died. Christ died for everyone. He died so that those who live should not live for themselves anymore, that they should live for Christ. And he died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we don't look at anyone the way the world does. At one time, we looked at Christ in that way, but we don't anymore. When anyone lives for Christ or when anyone lives in Christ, the new creation has come and the old has gone. The new is here. See, Paul, he is telling us that if we're in Christ, the old is gone. The old you has been put to death. And now the new has come, the new creation. See, all of this is from God. And God, he is reconciling us to himself through Jesus Christ. So he's telling us that we are Christ's champions. Those of us who believe in Christ, we are his champions. This brings us to our first point for the morning. What is your attitude towards the new year? What's your attitude towards this new year? See, every year it offers a chance to start a new beginning and it offers us a hope. But do we really believe that? Do we really believe that, that there's a new hope? Do we put ourselves in a position to receive the hope that Jesus Christ would have for us? See, most people, they look forward to the new year, a new start. And, and, but here's the thing. They see the new year coming. But they carry their own and their old hurts, habits, and hang-ups. They bring them right into the new year. They bring all that stuff into the new year. Now, a wife came into the bathroom and she saw her husband on the scale with his stomach sucked in. I've done that before. And she told him that sucking in his stomach wasn't going to help him at all. And he said that it would. It really would, because if he didn't, he wouldn't be able to read the numbers on the scale. So 
with that, I would like to say there's different things that motivate us to make our New Year resolution, right? And many different things, they motivate us to do that. And we can make uh, resolutions like, I'll quit this, or I'll start this, or, you know what, I'm never going to do that again. You know, and these are the things that kind of motivate us to, like, prompt us to say, next year, it's got to be better. See, resolutions, most of the time, they're not even kept for a month. I mean, let's be real. We just, sometimes they're just not obtainable. They're just warm fuzzies in, in our head. And a son asked his father what, the, what his New Year resolution was going to be. And the father said that he was going to do everything possible in, his, in this new year to make his mother very happy. And the son turned around and he asked his mother. And she said to do everything possible to make sure that your father keeps his resolution. Okay, see, our attitudes, seriously, our attitudes have everything to do with it. See, whether uh, we, we look at 2024 and how it ends up is really determining on our attitude. You know, what is our expectation of that? See, if you do not believe that anything is going to change in this year, new year of 2024, guess what? It's not. There, there won't be a change. So. If you need to be reminded this morning that you need to keep close to the Lord God in 2024, let me just say this. You're heading in the wrong direction. You need to reset your course. If you are trying to fix yourself or you're trying to find who you can blame for all the things that are going on in your life, you're heading in the wrong direction. In 2024, we have a, a, we have a, a renewed promise when we understand that without the Lord in 2024, it'll just be another year. It's just another year, another resolution, another goal. But it won't be a new life. It won't be a new life. See, looking for joy without the Lord at best, it's just circumstantial. It's just superficial. See, looking for peace, peace comes from God. And we know that. And it's not based upon not having trouble. Because, see, we think, I, I think we believe that, oh, if I could just have peace, that means no problems in my life. But that's not how it rolls with God. Because we're always going to have problems. There's always going to be trials in life. But here's the ticket. During those times, we can experience peace in those moments. Because God is with us. He's the God of peace. And he's with us in those trials. So looking for hope is based upon God's wisdom and strength that his will, the will of God will guide us through this journey of life and it'll take us right to his promises. Every single promise that God has made for us. If we follow him in this journey of life, it'll take us to his promises. See, our hope, it must be in Jesus Christ. Our second point for the morning, what part do I play in this change. So what part do I play in this change? In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it reads, when anyone lives in Christ, they are a new creation. A new creation has come and the old is gone and the new is here. Now, if you really look close at that, the key word here is in Christ, in Christ. See, he does not say that people that know of Christ, he doesn't say that. He says that people that are in Christ. So I guess the question would be, so what does that mean to be in Christ? What does that mean? And so in Christ, it, it really is about having an intimate relationship, a personal relationship with the risen Lord. That's what it means to be in Christ. See, to be in Christ is coming to a point in our life where we say, you know what? I've done the best that I can, and I know there has to be a better way to life. So you yield yourself to the lordship of Jesus Christ, that he was born of the virgin. We just celebrated that nativity. He was born of the virgin. He, he grew up and became a man, and in his manhood, what he did was he put himself on the cross because he knew that we needed to be forgiven. So he gave himself on the cross for us. And then 
Three days after that, he rose from the dead. And then he remained with us for 40 more days. And then he ascended into heaven with the Father. But he left the Holy Spirit. If you submit yourself and say, I believe that. And I believe that you are Lord and Savior, Jesus. Come into my life because I can't do this without you. Then you've given yourself and you are in Christ. That's what that means. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, he offers us a new life, a new creation. People, God is giving us a new life. The problem with most of us is that we know of Christ, but we're not willing to live in Christ. We kind of put, we kind of pump the brakes. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You remember the rich young ruler? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do all those things. And then Jesus said, but you got to give all your money to the poor and come follow me. And he's like, deal breaker, deal breaker, you know? So one way that I've been talking about here is living in according to the flesh. And one is living in accordance to the, to the spirit of God in our life. And the creative process that is going on in, in here is that there is a redemptive aspect now. And it is not destructive. It's not destructive. It is about a lordship of Jesus Christ within our life. All humanity, all humanity was born into Adam. Every person, you ever think about that? Every person that was born was born into Adam. See, Adam, he brought original sin into our humanity. And we're all born into that. According to the scriptures, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we've all find ourselves with a sinful nature. And that is known as the flesh. That's the flesh. But all Christians are supposed to be in Christ. Remember where I just gave a definition of what that was? This intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And so all Christians, we are supposed to be in Christ. And we are to be living by the Spirit of God. Living by the Spirit of God. Now, just like the ending of, a, 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 of one year and the beginning of a new year. Those that are in Christ, they should be quitting some of the things that they had been doing and leaving them behind. See, with those hopes of change that God wants to make within us, that's our hope. God, he wants to make those changes within our lives. And we pray and we ask God to take things away from us because we know there are things in our life that are harmful for us. So we ask God to take those things. And yet, Instead of just leaving them there, before we say amen, we go around and we pick them all back up. And then we say amen, walk out, an hour later, we're doing the same things again. You see, this new year, and hear me on this, people. This new year, leave your resentment behind. Leave your worries behind. Leave your failures behind. And, and hear me clearly on this, because... I'm not saying that you need to forget or you need to deny your past. I'm not saying that because truth be known, we need to learn from our past. We need to learn from our mistakes and we need to follow Christ. Let's just take a look at this word that I used here. Let's take a look at resentment. The word resentment, it just, it's, it's a huge deal if you really think about it. Because resentment, it can give way to anger. Anger can give way to hatred. And, and let me just tell you about that progression. And, and let me illustrate it to you. Let's just say somebody came up to me and they said, Pastor Ed, um, I don't know if I should tell you this, but you have the weirdest eyebrows I've ever seen in my life. You should really do something about that. You know, you should really do something about your eyebrows. So I look at them and I say, because now I have different responses that I can say. I could say, hey, you know what? You're an idiot. I can just like, I could just like totally throw my rage on him, right? Or I could sit there and say, thank you very much. I'm going to take that hurt and I'm just going to shove it down inside and I'm not going to say anything about it. Because either one of those are going to be hurtful. They're going to be destructive. And the reason is, is because if I shove that down in there, then what happens is, as time goes by and I have a resentment against that person as they come in and out of my life and I don't do anything with that issue of resentment, I don't resolve it, then what happens? 
what happens is my resentment, it has a progression and it automatically goes into anger, the next level. And so if I don't deal with, with the resentment, then resentment, it automatically goes to anger. And then when I see that person again, guess what? I'm just angry at them. And, and then I try to bring other people in and say, man, don't you think, what, you know, and then I start to gossip and sin and all these things. And then if I don't deal with my anger, you know what happens? Here's what happens. My anger, I don't deal with it. Time goes by and it goes to the next level. The next level is hatred. So now I hate that person. I hate that person. And, and it just seems kind of far-fetched. But you know what? I've been in ministry for 27 years now. And I've had so many people that I've counseled marital things. And I've had people come to me and they say, you know, I don't know what happened. We used to be in love. We've been married for 10 years. And now I can't stand them. Matter of fact, I hate them. And I don't know how I got here. Well, there you go. Resentment was never taken care of. So that's why I really honed down on that. Because it seems simple. Uh, I just have some resentment. Well, that's just the tip of the spear. And you got to deal with it. So what I'm saying is, <coughs> excuse me, I'm talking loud. <coughs> what I'm saying is <coughs> that resentment, <coughs> excuse me, resentment undealt with. It can be destructive. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the one that suffers from resentment suffers from unforgiveness. Now, you are not meant to carry that load from year to year. Think about that. Some people, they just carry that load from year to year. See, hurts, God has a design for that. And here's the design. We need to give our hurts to the Lord. We need to give our hurts to the Lord and not carry them around from year to year. See, worries, let's talk about worries. Worries, they take up time and energy. And you know what? The more I worry about things and I see other people worry about things, the more I totally understand that there is no godly outcome from worrying. There is no godly outcome from worrying about things. You can worry up a sweat. And there ain't no righteousness coming out of that. That's the truth. And the Bible tells us not to worry. Don't worry. So much of what we worry about, if you think about it, it never comes true. You know, we just worry about things. Oh, I'm worried. Oh, I'm worried that light might drop. But I don't worry about everything. And we don't need to. Now, there are two things that, we sh that should be on our mind as we go into the year 2024. The first one is changing from doing wrong to doing right in accordance with God's word. See, that's, that's what we need to put first and foremost on our mind. Second, realizing some things, they can't be changed. We just have to come to that understanding. Some things just can't be changed. And we need to have the Lord show us how to deal with both of those situations. We need God to teach us how to do that. Now, failures. Now, we believe that uh, we will fail in the, in the new year or in the old year. But the truth is, we fail when we do nothing. That's how we really fail. If we never try, that's failure. And if we are in Christ, we're not failures. Come on. If we're in Christ, we're not failures. No matter how many setbacks we may have in our life. Christ, he puts you back on your feet every single time. And then he calls you a winner because you're in Christ. So what is our part? What is our part in this whole picture now? And I want you to hear me on this. Our part is to be consistent to God and to allow God to be active in our life. That's, that's what we're supposed to be is consistent. That means consistent in reading the Bible. That means consistent in praying. That means consistent in our attendance uh, at church and worshiping together. That means my uh, consistency and giving back to the church. What God has given me, I give a percentage back on that. These are the consistencies that God is looking for. So in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10, 11, listen to what it says. Be strong in the Lord 
and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can uh, take your stance against the devil's schemes. See, the devil, he's scheming against you right now. You and me alike. Because he doesn't want you to have this fellowship. He doesn't want you to have this relationship with God. And some of you, to be really honest, you've been pretty beat up in this past year. Some of you guys, you've been beat up. And some things, to be really honest, we bring upon ourselves. And some things, they're unavoidable. Now in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, listen to what it says. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. That's what it says in Ephesians. This brings us to our third point for the morning. Finding God's will for your life in 2024. So in Ephesians 5, 17, listen to what it says. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That's interesting. Understand what the Lord's will is for you. And if you only know of Christ and you are not in Christ, you will not be able to understand God's will for you. That's just the truth. So God, he allows us to know his will for our lives as we seek and we listen for what he has for us. We have to have our ears and our eyes open and our nose in the word. And then we'll know what God's will is. So do you think that God, what do you, do you think that God's will in your life is worrying about everything? See, filling your mind up with troubled thoughts, all that does is it just brings a whole bunch of anxiety. Are we so busy that we can't even grasp a spiritual thought or have a devotional time with God? I mean, just think about that. Are you so busy that you just can't grasp a spiritual thought or sit down and have a devotional time with God? See, we need to establish our priorities. God, he must be first. God must be a part of our decision making process. He has to be. And as followers of Christ, you must be asking God for directions in your life. Think about last year. How many times did you say, eh, put the brakes on? Father God, I don't know about this. Could you please show me? Or did you let your feelings and emotions let you go through that red light with full throttle? You see, we have to be searching for God's direction. We have to be asking him to show us the direction. You know, I led, I led uh, Celebrate Recovery here for 15 years at our church. 15 years I did Celebrate Recovery. And we helped a lot of people in their addictions to allow God to heal them and, and leave those addictions behind. But the thing is, in those 15 years, every single meeting, we closed it with the same prayer. And it's called the serenity prayer. And for 15 years, we, so that serenity prayer is like imprinted on my mind. And so much so that I kind of made it my own. You know, I say it every day, but I recreated it and made it mine. So I thought I would read this to you because this really helps me. And I think it's going to help us as we go into this new year. So this is how the serenity, Ed Rain's serenity prayer goes. It goes like this. God, grant me peace to accept the things that I cannot change. OK, let's hold it right there. You're saying that there are things that I'm not going to be able to change. Now, I have to come to terms and accept that. I have to come to terms to accept that. But to do that, I have to have the peace of God. God, grant me, this, grant me the peace to accept the things that I cannot change. Think about that. How would that make your New Year's different? Seriously. See, and then next, the courage to change the things that I can. You're telling me there are things that I can change? I like that. There are things that I can change, but the courage to change the things. So you guys have known me long enough and you've heard my definition of courage because courage means a lot. Integrity means a lot to me. I live for those things. So you've heard my definition of courage, but I'm going to tell you again. Courage, the Ed Rain definition of courage is this. Be afraid, but do what's right. And that equates courage. But here's the thing. Be afraid, do what's right, but not of your own mind. Don't do it from what you think. 
See, do what God says in his word. See, that's the right thing. And that's, I think, where a lot of us fall because we fall back on what I think is right. So what I'm saying to you is to be courageous, to have courage, be afraid, do what's right in accordance with God's word. And that equates courage. It really does. And what's the opposite of courage? The opposite of courage is being afraid and not doing anything. And what does that equate? A coward. I mean, that's the opposite of courage. It creates a coward. Being afraid and not doing anything creates a coward. And that's just the truism of that. Do you have the right attitude to see this happen in your life? Are you ready to move forward in this new year, people? Are we ready to take a stand? Because this world is waiting for us. This world, it needs love, the love of Christ. I, I, I watch some of you and how it is that you're really on mission. I watch Gary and Martha and oh my goodness, they sent me a picture of a man and Carolyn had, uh, was it crochet? You crocheted a cap for her and scarves and you guys went out and helped the homeless and you took a picture and he had the cap and the scarf. He even had a sandwich. And I saw he had new socks sitting on the curb with him. And so when I looked at that picture, I thought, courage, courage, be afraid, but do what is right. That's what we have to be about this new year. You know, as your pastor, I, I was thinking this year, oh, my goodness, what, what am I going to say? I, I, most pastors, they do this wonderful vision thing of the whole new year. And I've only been with you as your senior pastor for three months. I don't know what to say. And God spoke to me and he said, well, Ed, just be courageous. Do what's right. Don't be afraid. Just do what's right. So I said, OK, Lord. And you know what the Lord said to me? He said, focus. Focus, Ed, because you've been given a wonderful body. And uh, uh, God's bride, you, the church. And so because of that, our vision for the new year is to do Sunday school to start a membership and to make sure that our men and women's ministries are flourishing, to make sure that we're giving so that we can do ministry together. These are the fundamentals that we can't just jump over. We have to be strong together. And for me as your pastor, that's what I'm saying this year. And when people see us loving each other, they're going to know us by our love. And they're going to say, well, what's going on? I don't know what that is, but whatever that is, I want a piece of that. Probably better than Gouda cheese, right? <laughs> so that's where we're at. And that's what the Lord has put on my heart for you guys. And I don't know where you're at today, spiritually. I don't. But wherever you're at in your journey, I'd like to start out this new year just by saying this. You're done with the old year and you're starting a new one. Have you received Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't, please, in, in a little bit, Martha's going to be playing for us. And, and I'm going to just do a straight up good old altar, altar call. If you would like to receive Christ, just come up in that moment. Or maybe, because I mentioned membership, maybe you want to be a part of this church. But maybe you've been here 20 years. You're like, Pastor Ed, I've been here 20 years. Do I need to be a member? I thought I was. Well, you are. We'll grandfather that in, right? But... If you feel like you, you really want to be a part of this body of Christ right here, Northside, as we grow, as we move forward, as we make a difference in this world, come forward. Be a part of us. And this will be our first invitation to ask people to come and be a member of our church because we're starting membership. So I'm going to pray right now. And then, Martha, would you come and put the response song for us? Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just want to tell you, thank you. Thank you so much for this day. The days like this is when we really feel your comfort, Lord, and, and how it is that in intimate moments like this, you strengthen us. You, you bring to us, Father God, a wisdom, an understanding that goes beyond our own understanding. So help us as Northside community family here, Lord. Help us to really make a difference in this new year. Unite us and, and help us to be a light that you would have us to be on this corner. And Lord, I pray for all the people that are becoming this year that don't know you. I'm so excited to meet them. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would use us. 
you know, as we go our separate ways and we live different lives, help us to reach and to connect with people that don't know you. We love you, Lord. And we thank you for the new year. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you for family. We thank you for all that we've received. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.